Today we're going to look at Romans 1, 18 to 32, and it really begins the meat of what Paul has just said. So to summarize what we where we've been so far in Romans 1, 1 through 17 is the basic introduction to the book. And Paul has introduced himself, saying that he's an apostle and a servant of the gospel. He has introduced the things that he's passionate about, which is the gospel and Jesus and the people of Rome. He's introduced the church at Rome. Even though he hasn't met them, he has used words like, I am eager and longing to see you. And then he has introduced the thesis to the book of Romans. That is, I am unashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, we begin the meat. Now, when we start a passage saying the righteousness of God is revealed, we might tend to picture that he's about to describe God's mercy or God's faithfulness or God's patience, God's love, God's um, desire to that all would be saved in sending his son. But instead, he starts in a very antithetical way. He says the righteousness of God is revealed. And then the very next verse is the wrath of God is being revealed. Wrath. Anger. This isn't something we normally associate with the righteousness of God. If Paul is trying to prove that Jesus and God are completely good and righteous and just, then you would expect him to use words that are synonymous with good in our mind. Now, I would venture to say that God can't be good, righteous, and just if he doesn't show wrath. See, his wrath is based on his relationship. So let's look at what wrath means. Now, wrath is anger, but it's it's on a spectrum of anger. There, You might get frustrated that, you know, somebody said something against you. You might get angry when you lose a game. But wrath is a totally different, different level. So it is still anger, but it is a more intense version of anger. It is anger that leads to action. And God's righteousness is revealed in that he is full of wrath. Now, let me describe that because we often think of God being full of wrath as sitting as a judge, hammering down condemnation on a people that he is very distant from. However, wrath is part of a relationship. God could not be good if he was not also full of wrath because there is there are certain covenantal relationships that are worth fighting for and worth getting angry over. And so here, God shows his righteousness by being angry at the fact that his people who he created for his own glory have turned away from him and they have turned away from him in such grand fashion. And he longs for that relationship. He longs for that covenantal relationship. And so his wrath is exhibited because he is good and just. My husband and I love each other. We are in a covenantal relationship. But if my husband chose to walk out on me for another person, my love for him would be exhibited in my wrath towards his actions. My goodness my purity would be exhibited in the fact that I'm going to fight for and get angry over and have consequences for him leaving that covenantal relationship. And so we need to picture this whole passage in the light of God wanting and desiring to have a covenantal relationship with his people who have chosen to walk out and follow their own path, who have chosen against this God who created them. And so he is full of wrath and rightfully so. Okay, so God's wrath is revealed against two things. He says the wrath of God is being revealed against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress their truth by their wickedness. Now, while godlessness and wickedness are kind of synonyms for sin, there's more going on here. See, um, when he describes godlessness, he's not describing modern atheism, as that is pretty m modern. Um, it, in the ancient world, they didn't believe that there was no God. Um, instead, what he means is living your life as if there is no God. And if there is no God, there is no ultimate authority. If there is no authority, then there is no law base that I need to follow. And so this is a mental heart assertion that I, I do what I want. Um, it is a thought 
that there is no God. And if there is no God, there is no authority over me. It's going to play itself out in my actions. And so godlessness really is taking place in the mind where wickedness are the actions that are developed from a godless mind. So if in your mind you think there is no God and he has no authority, then you're going to live that out by doing the actions of wickedness. And so he says God's wrath is revealed against the thought that there is no God and that I'm subject to no God and the actions of wickedness and sin. And he says, these people suppress the truth with their wickedness because they, the desires of their heart, they want to do something. And so Paul is saying there is plenty of evidence that there is a God, and yet they are living as if there is not. So in verse 18, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth with their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clear, clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So God has shown from the beginning of time that he exists. He has shown two things in creation. When man looks at creation, he should see that there is a God and that he is powerful. He shows his divine nature his existence, and the fact that there is a design in the things that we see around us. You don't have to look very far into nature to see great design and intricate detail. A spider web, for instance, is one of the most geometrically strong shapes that there is. And what put it in it in a spider to make this web that's able to sustain, you know, a fly coming into it without being destroyed? Um, you don't have to look far in nature, but before you see a designer and things like ecosystems and how the human body works and um, food chains, uh, there is great design, great, great design in all of nature. There's also great power in nature. The, we don't have to look far into nature to see natural disasters like tornadoes and hurricanes and tsunamis and earthquakes and wildfires to see that nature is incredibly powerful. And we don't even have to go down the route of natural disasters. If we just take water, for instance, the waves against the shore are able to corrode an entire beach over a long period of time. Just because that water is so incredibly powerful and the tides are so powerful. And so what God wants us to do is look at nature and go, there must be a God. And this God must be powerful. This is the conclusion that thousands upon thousands of cultures have come up with throughout all of history. They have looked at things like the Nile and said, there must be a God of the Nile, and that God must be powerful. Powerful enough to give us life or give us death. Um, same thing with the Aztecs and the Mayas, the ancient Chinese. They looked at nature and they saw there is some kind of divine force, and that divine force is incredibly powerful. And so because God put this on people's hearts, in Ecclesiastes it says, it says that eternity is written on the hearts of men. God put eternity on our hearts so that we know this truth when we look at nature, that there is a God and that God is powerful. And so we stand without excuse. And yet, people live godlessly and people do wickedness. They act as if there is no God. They act as if there is no authority. And yet they have that same truth exhibited in nature. And so men are without excuse. Now, God wanted a reaction from people. He wanted people to look at nature and somehow respond. And this is the response that he wanted. This is from verse 21. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings, birds and animals and reptiles. God wanted people to do two things. He wanted them to glorify him as God and to thank him. He wanted us to look out into nature and go, holy cow, this sunset is amazing. Therefore, there must be an amazing God who made it. And God, thank you so much. He wanted us to look at things like the ocean and go, there must be a God and this God must be powerful. Thank you so much for this ocean and this beauty you created. 
God wanted us to acknowledge his existence and thank him for his creation. And yet, people's thinking became futile. They became fools. They willingly became fools. And they willingly exchanged the glory of the immortal God for mere images. And so they worshipped created things and not the creator. They worshipped images of birds and animals and reptiles and even humans. God wanted them to worship him. And instead, they worship their own images. Because if I make an image in my image, if I make a God in my image, that means that I am the ultimate authority and I get to decide what I do with my life. If I worship a God that I cannot see and I have no control over, then that means he gets to dictate what I do with my life. And so God's wrath is expressed. So in summary, God gave his creation and his image so that people would worship him and thank him. Instead, they willingly believed a lie and worshiped created things instead of the creator. And so we have the possibly the saddest words in the whole Bible. So God gave them over. And we're going to see in three different stages, God giving them over to the sin they so de demanded. When God gives someone over, he's not just giving. So God gave them over doesn't just mean God allows them to do what they want to do, even though that is what, what is happening. It also means that God is releasing himself from this presence with his people. God is no longer there with them. He is allowing them to do the godless and wicked things that they want to do, but he's also releasing himself from this presence, and he's releasing himself from protecting them from the consequences. And so when God gives people over, it is as if he is allowing them to walk into the darkness and he is pulling the light away. And so we see in three stages that God gives them over to three different things, each one worse than the previous one. The first one, he says in verse 24, um, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who was forever praised. Amen. So he gave them over to sinful desires. And this is sexual impurity. Um, uh, other translations use sexual immorality. Immorality has the root word of moral, which means standard. And God's standard is one man and one woman in marriage for life. And yet... They sought out sexual immorality, meaning outside of that norm, outside of that standard. Um, and so sexual morality involves all kinds of things with multiple partners, adultery, rape, incest. All of those things now become culturally pervasive. See, this is not an indictment against any one person. This is an indictment against a culture who has chosen to live outside of the will of God. And so this culture has now been given over to their sinful desires. The next stage of giving over is found in verse 26 uh, and 27. He says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. So here we have shameful lusts, um, which is describing homosexuality. So God, once again, has given them over to another stage of, um, of immorality. First, where a culture has become pervasively sexual, and then where a culture has allowed and initiated homosexual activities. Now he goes on to the next stage, and, and here the indictment gets even worse, and the staircase goes down even further. Furthermore, just they, they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips and slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. 
And so now God gives them over to a depraved mind. And while we have a huge long list of sinful activities, um, this really is summarized by saying being unable to tell the difference between right and wrong. Now, I want to give just a little bit of teaching here for a second because I think that the evangelical church in the modern America has um, demonized homosexuality bigger and badder than any other sin. And yet on this list, we have people who gossip and slander. On this list of a depraved mind, we have people who disobey their parents. Um, we have people who act maliciously towards others, meaning wanting to ca cause harm to another human being. And so we often say that homosexuality is the worst possible sin. It is not. Because a depraved mind means that you don't know what is right from wrong. It means that you disobey your parents as a culture. And I would venture to say that this is where we are as an American society. We have been given over in many ways to a pervasive sexual culture. We have been given over in so many ways to a depraved mind where we see evil and we applaud evil, where we see it on TV and it becomes highly rated. We look at violence and sexuality in such a way that it no longer has any impact on us at all. And so I think if Paul were standing here, he would say, we are this society. We have in many ways been given over to a depraved mind so that we don't even know what is right and wrong. Now, this all seems like really dark, bad news, and yet the good news will come. But first, Paul has to make the case, you have to realize that you are broken and in need of a Savior if you're going to receive this salvation. And you have to realize that the righteousness of God is encapsulated by the wrath of God because we have broken covenant with him. We have walked away from him. We have chosen our own sinful desires, and so he has given us over. We have to see ourselves here. We are a people who are broken and who are in desperate need of a Savior.